You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Well, hello again, everyone. This is Doug Thorpe, and you're listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I think we have a good one for you today, and this topic is going to be focused at entrepreneur owners and founders who might be approaching that great life-changing moment where you think you want to sell or exit your business. My guest today is a, is a professional who specializes in helping owners evaluate evaluate their business and create valuations to go to market his name is dave bookbinder dave welcome to the show hey doug thanks so much for having me pleasure to be here so i think this is a a, a really important topic for the masses and and i know you can go different places and read in the news that there's an estimated six or seven trillion dollars of, of wealth built up in private companies around the U.S. that are owned by baby boomers who have been at it for a long time, working hard, and they are reaching those life stages where they might want to exit. And they are sadly aware that nobody in the family wants to take over the business. There's no opportunity for generational handoff. So they have to go to market to get the value out of what they've worked so hard to create. So the real question comes down to a simple, what is your business worth in today's market? So Dave, if we can, uh, let's start by just a little bit of level set. Tell, tell folks a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into this part of the business world. Yeah. So, uh, Thanks again for having me here. So I lead the valuation practice at an accounting firm called Hayfley Flanagan in New Jersey. So a full service accounting firm, audit tax. We also do consulting, which includes leadership coaching and exit readiness. And then, like I said, I lead the valuation practice. Uh, I've been doing this way longer than I care to admit, Doug. And I got into it in a kind of a circuitous path. I always thought I was going to be an investment manager, um, you know, running money and managing wealth. And uh, going through MBA school, I was majoring in... Uh, uh, finance and slash investment management. And in the corporate finance track, I got turned on by that and found a job ad on the job board at, at the school I was attending for my master's degree. And it, it was a position for a valuation analyst. And the job description sounded an awful lot like what I was learning in MBA school. And I thought that was really interesting. So uh, I jumped in, started there, graduated, if you will, to uh, investment banking, worked my way up the corporate finance food chain from valuation to buy side and sell side M&A. Uh, raising senior debt and asset securitization, did that for a while, and then realized ultimately valuation was the most intellectually gratifying for me. Awesome. Well, so if we can, I, I mean, I as I present this show, I, I say leadership powered by common sense. So in real simple terms, what does knowing a valuation of a business really mean to the owner? It means a lot. Um, I like to joke around that uh, my wife is a nurse and what she does, it really is important in the world. It's she's saving lives. And by comparison, what I do is BS. But the reality is in working with my privately owned business clients, valuation is almost as close to life and death as what she's doing in the real world. And by that, what I mean is it, it not only determines what they walk away with at the end of the day, like you alluded to in the opening when you talk about an exit, but it's got to be a guidepost for how you manage your business day to day, how you think about your overall asset allocation when you think about your, your portfolio. There's just so many components. And if you don't know what your business is worth, you're really behind the eight ball. And unfortunately, I've read statistics recently that the preponderance of business owners in the U.S. do not know the value of their business. They think they do, but they really don't. Right. Well, when we were in the green room kind of running up and preparing for the show today, we were talking about the idea. You and I both have experiences with knowing sellers who are ready. They, they've reached that real critical pivot. They've got to exit the business. And they have heard from a friend, a family member, a beer drinking buddy or somebody that their business ought to be worth $7 million. And when a professional like yourself gets in and really works the numbers, you discover the true fair value is maybe like four and a half or five million, not seven. So th there's this arbitrary frustration and disappointment at knowing the true numbers. So that that's an issue in and of itself. But to your point, 
for an owner that is not yet ready to exit, maybe getting that professional help to value today what the business is worth. And if that number falls short of what they desire, what they project in their own financial planning for long-term exit, then they, there are steps they can do to work the business to get it up to that higher number and, and make it then at that point a, a valid and sustainable number. Yeah, so much to unpack there. And let me let me try going with uh, the way you started by talking about the, the misinformation that a lot of business owners get. And I, I do a lot of presentations for business owners and CFOs and talking about valuation methodologies. And one of the first slides I show them um, is the, the back of the envelope method and the back of the napkin method for business valuation. Those aren't real valuation methods, as you well know, Doug. But unfortunately, like you said, folks are getting information. Uh, they may show up at cocktail parties. They may be at an event and they bump into an attorney. It could be their brother-in-law, who knows, but they, they'll typically be told your business is worth like five or six times EBITDA. That, that's generally been the rule of thumb. I've heard a lot, but when you get to uh, start to look under the hood, that's where you really start to understand what the true value of the business is. I'm going to get to the, the drivers in just a second, but when you talk about um, the companies that are thinking about an exit somewhere down the road, that's where we can really add the most value. If, if a business owner is at a spot where it's the kind of the oh shit moment and they have to put the for sale sign on the front lawn, uh, my advice is get an investment banker or a business broker if you're a small company, let them represent you. You'll probably get your valuation analysis done for free in the process, but you don't go it alone. Um, but if you have the time and you're doing the planning, as I hope you are, or you should be, um, there's a lot of things you can do because selling your business is a process. It's not just an event. It's more than the transaction. You've got to get yourself sale ready. And th the reality is you could be bought any day of the week. You may not think you're for sale, but somebody could approach you tomorrow and make you an offer. Uh, somebody can get sick. Somebody dies. Somebody gets disabled. Things happen. And suddenly you need to have your business ready for sale. So swinging it all the way back to the disconnect between expectations when you start to look at a business, it, it's not just enough to say, what were recent transactions in the business, in the industry that you operate in, for example? And, and you can look at the industry and identify multiples and so forth. And let's just for argument's sake, pretend that we agree that a median multiple uh, in your industry is six for EBITDA. But we've got to take a look at what your company looks like relative to those acquired companies. Do you have the same history of growth? Do you have the same history of profitability, depth of management? access to capital. There's a whole host of things, risk factors that, that are nuanced adjustments. And the best way I can analogize it is think about it if you're going to buy or sell a house. You go to your realtor, you get the comps list, and then you start making adjustments for the differences between your home and the other homes that have sold recently. And the number of bathrooms, proximity to shopping, it's the same deal. Right. Yeah, those same criteria. And I, too, use that home selling analogy to try to help represent the, the challenge here, because there are so many factors. And, and in terms of the internal workings of a business, you, you highlighted a couple, you know, the depth of management. Too often, entrepreneurial startups are dominated by the owner. It's the owner founder who controls everything. And when I take on those individuals as clients, I tell them, I, I kind of give them the cold water in the face. If that's your story, you do not have a sellable asset, period. You know, if you've done nothing to delegate, relegate, and define a, a spread of day-to-day -day responsibilities to others, you don't have a sellable asset because guess what? You don't want to be there. You, you want to be stepping away. Well, if you step away, the business crumbles. So that's usually, at least in my humble opinion, the very first test and first threshold of where an owner sits on the opportunity to cash out. Yeah. And what you're alluding to there is something that your listeners may have heard in the context of key man risk. Uh, right. all, all of the business is a function of you as the owner entrepreneur. If, if you got hit by the bus tomorrow or if you won the lottery tomorrow, the business probably disappears. And underpinning that whole thing, Doug, which is really a key valuation driver that I want to make sure your audience understands, is there's a there's a relationship between risk and value or risk and reward from the perspective of the would-be buyer. And anything that you're able to do that can mitigate the risk to the buyer is going to, all other things equal, increase your valuation. Correct. 
And, you know, and then if you if you get past that dominance of the owner as a as a key player day to day, you get past that. Then other factors that I'm familiar with looking at are things like, do you have process and procedure to define your business? Or if I walked in your shop, is everything going to have sticky notes all over it? You know, that like if you're in a service business. Is your dispatcher somebody who works on a pad and paper? Well, that's not a system. I'm sorry. It it might have worked for you quite well, but again, it's not conducive to high value sales. So, um, the question of system systematization, if I can get that word out, and process to be able to scale and repeat you know, successfully what you're doing, that that's all part of the equation as well. Yeah, you've got to look and behave like a real business. And again, when a buyer comes in and kicks the tires and they see those sticky notes in lieu of procedure manuals and processes in place, that's a red flag for more risk. And again, there's that, that relationship between risk and valuation. So completely agree with you. Yeah. Now, Dave, you you also shared with me in the green room. You you have prepared a, a list uh, of uh, originally it was ten. Now you say it's eleven factors. Uh, tell tell the audience a little more about that list. Yeah, so I do a lot of work with business owners, and I've I've seen a lot throughout my career. And I decided I was going to memorialize some of the top mistakes and. It started out as what you call the traditional top 10 list, but I had to recently add number 11. And I'll share that one with you right now because I thought it was insanely crazy. Uh, that's kind of redundant, but point of emphasis, it's nuts. Um, doing some research and reading on the internet on valuation, uh, someone had recommended to business owners, don't waste your time or money getting a business valuation. They're too expensive and too complicated, both of which are untrue. They then go on to provide advice to the would-be entrepreneurs by saying, here's all you need to do. Uh, here's a link to a website where you can find recent EBITDA multiples for industries. Search your industry, find your average EBITDA multiple, and multiply it by last year's sales. L let me repeat that. You're going to multiply your, your revenue by an EBITDA multiple. I, 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 I had to add that because that, that, that's egregious. Just, just so the audience is clear, if you're going to use a, a multiple of revenue, uh, you multiply the revenue multiple by, by by revenue, the metric, and likewise EBITDA. You don't mix and match. Yeah. Well, and to that point, <clears throat> I'm thinking of clients I've, I've had. That's going to have to get cut out. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, it's a sign to my editor. We'll fix that. I've had clients who have have gotten really confused very fast about you know, the use of multiples in estimating and uh, pricing their business. So uh, what are some of the other elements around what you just said? Yeah, so using the multiples is just one way to think about valuing your business. So uh, the, the multiples can fall short, especially if you've got a business that's on a different trajectory historically versus prospectively. So let's say a business has been chugging along at call it 10% top line growth year over year doing really well, okay? Margins have been consistent. What does the future look like? Uh, if they've recently lost a customer and they know that next year sales and the year after that is not gonna be the same 10% annual growth rate, that's a different story. And it's a different indication of value. It's a different multiple you'd select because you're not getting the same level of growth. Um, a lot of times, when folks go into this exercise of, of selling their business and they're, they're asked to prepare a forecast, certainly in my world, when I'm helping clients in evaluation, if they haven't done any business planning, a lot of times I'm the first one telling them, I really need you to start thinking about what's the next three years or five years look like. And especially in the case of a sale, Doug, and I'm sure you've seen this one, they put together what's called the hockey stick forecast, where in my previous example, that 10% revenue growth rate historically year over year over year now that we're going to sell the business next year, it's going to be 70% growth. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got this huge uptick. Um, again, that's a big red flag to a prospective buyer because they, if you haven't done it before, they, they are really going to need to understand how you're going to get there from here. Right. So 
another component of risk. So there's an income approach in, in valuation. It's not just about multiples, but we can discuss that if you're interested. Right. Well, and related to that, I, I think it dips into the notion of customer concentration. If uh, I know I, I tell my buying clients to ask for a customer list of, you know, who are your top 10 customers or something like that. And, and what is their relative contribution to top side revenues? And when you see a picture that one client, one customer is 30% of revenue, well, that's a red flag because oh the proverbial question is, well, what happens if they change their mind or, or they get sold and, and you're not their vendor of choice anymore? You know, what does that do to your revenue picture? Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see your 30% and raise you because I had a conversation with a business <laughs> owner not too long ago who was telling me that his, his top customer is about 80% of sales. Ouch. And, Ooh, and, wow. but, but, and, and he actually thought it through <clears throat> and said that, uh, it's easier just to continue to sell to this one customer than it is to go out and acquire new ones. But to your point, what happens if they go away? Well, and I I had experience dealing with a client that had uh, a, a really fat concentration of, of clients and there was a falling out with with one of the lead clients that represented i think the number was about 40 percent of revenue at the time and the owner was sitting there going good riddance i'm glad they're gone and i'm like oh really you know you you couldn't come closer to the middle in solving this problem you know that the customer didn't really want to go away but they had an issue with some things that were happening and wanted to talk about it and the owner just really wasn't willing to entertain that. And I'm like, which arm did you just cut off? You know, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> tell exactly. me how that's going to work for you. Buyers are going to ask for that. They're going to look for the, the customer concentration list. hundred percent. It's part of due diligence. You can count on it. Yep. Yeah. Well, the other thing I, I want to go back to your point about the mixing numbers and confusing the equation. I think one cautionary flag for sellers out there is that if you want to enter into this season of experience with your business, there are websites that offer all manner of crazy ideas about helping you get to sale and um, promises of how the numbers work and all of that are all over the board. and. I think it's a it is a cautionary tale to tell people to find a credible uh, valuator person or a broker that is going to be willing to help you with that, and and you know interview brokers if you're really ready to put a listing on the market. Interview brokers just maybe as you would a realtor. Back to the house analogy, you know. It, I know a lot of people, they take a word of mouth referral and they, they engage a realtor without ever talking to anybody else about selling their house, but you should really consider, I, I would argue, at least two or three and, and get some differing opinions on how this process should work and what you might get for their support or from their support. I think the same is applicable here too. Yeah, 100%. In the same way you would look to a realtor to find out, have they sold homes in your neighborhood? You know, are they familiar? Do they know the nuances? Uh, same thing in selecting somebody to rep represent you in the sale transaction. You're absolutely right. Talk to a couple and you make sure they've got the requisite industry experience. Make sure they've worked with companies of your size. And look, there's a personality component too, because the process is going to take some time. It, it could take three months. It could take 18 months. And you're going to have to work with this person, you know, through thick and thin and negotiations and diligence phase. And you want to be able to, to get along with them and collaborate with them. So there's a personality fit too. Yeah. <clears throat> I know we don't have time probably to work through uh, back to your list uh, idea again. Um, can, can you give me some of the high points of the other 10 that are on your now list of 11? Yeah, I'm going to summarize it. If your audience takes away nothing else, I want them to understand and with emphasis that valuation is a forward looking exercise. It's great that you've had the performance historically. But buyers and investors want to know, what does the future look like? And I, I mentioned risk more than once here. And 
Uh, I won't get into the weeds and get wonky with you, but buyers are going to do an income-based model, discounted cash flow analysis, where they're going to take a look at your future economic benefits, and they're going to bring them back discounted to today's dollars at a risk rate. And that risk rate is going to determine your valuation. So the higher the risk rate, the lower the value. That's why I keep saying anything that you can do that's going to lower the risk in the buyer's eyes will move the needle in that discount rate. It'll move the needle in multiple selection and it will increase your valuation. Well, that, that really makes a lot of sense. And I, I agree wholeheartedly that that has been my experience, the whole notion of de-risking your business because, uh, well, I'll, I'll pick one off the list that I know, know of and back to the key man idea, the owner, you know, might be the primary key man slash woman in the business. Um, but you may have others if you've got a general manager or an office manager or a uh, foreman or plant supervisor, you, you know, the list is long of what the possibilities are. They too represent key man risk. And part of the analysis I know I help buyers work on in due diligence is not only knowing who those people are on the org chart, but do a little bit of work in what they do and is there a backup for that role? Because if, again, anybody on that org chart that's critical goes poof, uh, who's going to cover and what kind of gap does that hold for the business? Thanks for introducing one of my favorite topics, the value that people contribute to an enterprise. And I know you know that I've written a couple of books on this topic, and it's becoming more and more prevalent in diligence as, as sophisticated buyers are starting to recognize that there is this true intangible asset in the form of people, the human capital, that contain institutional knowledge. And if they walk out the door, there's a lot of stuff that goes with them. It's not just you can easily replace them by offering a similar salary and benefits. Yeah. Well, yeah, to that point, I, I know the, the buyers that I work with, we actually have an exercise that we encourage them to engage during due diligence of creating a skills matrix of all the people in the business and identifying the key contributing knowledge and expertise they bring. I, I do a lot of work in the in the uh, what is I guess classically called home services business, plumbers, electricians, HVAC, and others. And in in many of those businesses, right off the top, there's the issue of who holds a master license, master electrician, master plumber, or whatever. Jurisdictions all over the country have different rules about what licensing is required to perform those services. But for a buyer, that's a big risk because the buyer is unlikely to hold a license like that, at least the ones I work with. So it's OK if you have somebody on the payroll that does hold that license that satisfies the statutes. But uh, that immediately calls that person a, a key man in the sense of the risk assessment we're talking about. Yeah. So you've got you've got to look at the ability to retain that person and keep them post close so that uh, they're a part of the industry or I mean a part of the business because otherwise if they walk away you legally cannot perform your service in your market yeah it's one of those classic examples of a company where the assets go home at the end of the day so right. super important yes they, they're looking at your customer list but it's it's more than that yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, let's, um, before we get away from this, let, let's talk about one of my favorite, I guess I'll call it a pet peeve, in, in the transaction of the buy-sell event. Uh, a common theme that creates more trouble than it's ever should be worth is the notion of the amount of working capital in the deal. And what, what say you about calculating and evaluating and factoring working capital in one of these buy-sell transactions? Yeah, so in my world, uh, I'm not usually deeply involved in, in setting the working capital recommendations, Doug, but uh, there are benchmarks that you can refer to. There's publicly, data, publicly traded data that's available of companies that are in the public space. Uh, and there's some also private data benchmarks that you can utilize to look to determine what is normalized working capital. But I'd say make sure you're discussing that with your attorneys and make sure that you're you're documenting whatever the necessary true ups are so that you don't get blindsided at the back end. Yeah. 
I've had a number of buyers that have really gotten tripped up over that, and it's largely because the seller is not fully understanding one way or the other what the working capital component represents. And uh, to, to give a simple example, I was involved with a transaction uh, late last year where when you look at the financials, and I'm now I'm talking balance sheet, not, not income statement, but there's $400,000 cash in the bank. Okay, great. Burn rate for running the business month over month was about 250 per month. So just, just their core overhead average cost of goods was about 250. Well, if the buyer experienced a month where somehow, some way they got no revenue, they would be eating into that 400,000 very quickly, right? That That's a simple example of the use of working capital. Cause, cause what, you gotta pay payroll, you gotta pay your electric bill, you gotta pay your basic operating expense. But in this transaction, the seller was fully convinced that I'm gonna get my purchase price plus I'm gonna cash out 400,000 at the end of the day and, I, and walk away. Well, you know, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be some working capital left in the business. So, sure. so you're back to that fundamental understanding of basic expectation on both parties, the buyer and the seller, that um, there and, and it involves basically getting capable, qualified advisors to explain the significance of those numbers and how they play into the overall deal. And in this case, the discussion we ended up having was, okay, fine, you can take your 400 out of the bank, but guess what? Purchase price gets adjusted accordingly. Yeah, don't don't use your your brother-in-law or fraternity <clears throat> brother, the, the personal injury lawyer to help you in papering a sale transaction. Use a, a true professional who works in that space. Absolutely. And, and I know we don't have enough time to get into all of this, but also just fair warning to those of you we're speaking to in the sale mode, you also need to get proper counsel and advice from your wealth manager and your CPA about the tax consequences of what this transaction is going to look like, because structure of those transactions can radically impact your tax one way or the other. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I wrote an article some time ago. It's called uh, Thinking of Selling Your Business. Here's five things you need and one you don't. And in that article, it's a it's a story of something that's a regular occurrence for me where people say, hey, I need a valuation. I'm thinking of selling my business. And this story details one of those conversations where this is a buyer or excuse me, a seller who was at that moment where they needed to put the for sale sign in the front lawn. And my recommendation was to use this investment bank to help you with the sale. But the point of emphasis to your point was, you, you need a good CPA firm. And sometimes you're going to graduate from the firm that you were working with historically as you're moving into something that's a little more sophisticated. The wealth manager, critical, because you don't need to necessarily squeeze every nickel out of the sale transaction if you can have the proceeds managed appropriately and still live your lifestyle the way you'd like to. Uh, also right. in there, I recommend make sure you get a good deal attorney, you know, use your professionals and so forth, but choose a quarterback. Make sure you've got somebody who is you know, the ringleader and making sure that all those professionals are talking to one another so that um, your, your best interest is served throughout the whole process. Absolutely. Very good point. And it's, it's almost like not to beat the home building or home selling uh, analogy to death, but it, very similar to building a house. You know, you want a general contractor who is going to corral all the subs. And if you dare launch that effort thinking you're going to be the general contractor, you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to pull all the pieces together. And to your point, same thing is true in the in the sale transaction of a of a meaningful business. There there are enough moving parts. You need to have subs that are specialists in all of those areas and able to orchestrate it. But you need a I like your word quarterback to oversee all that and keep everybody on point. And yeah, the more you analogize it with the real estate, I think the more it resonates because most people can relate to that. And <clears throat> if you're able to help them understand it in that context, it's going to add a lot of value for them when you're yeah. going through the process. Well, the, the correlations are just undeniable. I mean, I mean, it's, it's almost line for line, a, a, a very similar exercise. So, um, 
Well, Dave, I, I know we're about up on time for this episode. I really appreciate you sitting in. Uh, tell folks the best way to get a hold of you if they're interested in working with you or knowing more. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate you having me. And for your audience, I, I am always happy to have a conversation. I'm not concerned if there's an engagement at the other end. Uh, your audience will get my best advice on how to think about valuation, how to think about who they should be speaking to, et cetera. So I invite them to reach out. Uh, they can do that. They can find me on LinkedIn as Dave Bookbinder. I also host a business talk show called Behind the Numbers. It's available wherever you get your podcast. Uh, the firm website is uh, Hayfley Flanagan, hfco.com. And if you're curious about those books that I referred to about the value that people contribute to an enterprise, you can check them out at newroi.com. Newroi.com. Great. And the new ROI is return on individuals. Ah, I like it. I like it. Well, as always, folks, we're going to have those links and that contact information for Dave in our show notes. So feel free when you um, get get a moment, uh, check out their show note. You'll have that information. You can hop over and grab him. So one last time, Dave, thanks so much for sitting in. My pleasure. Well, with that, folks, we're going to uh, sign off and say goodbye. I do like to remind you, we've got a video version of this show over on YouTube, channel by the same name, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. And uh, for those of you who may be listening and you're on the buyer side of things, actually, or seller side, either way, um, reach out to me if you like. I can introduce you to the network at Acquira. That's A-C-Q-U-I-R-A, Acquira.com. But with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Go out there. Make it a great day. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.